Well, good morning. Welcome to another Sunday service here at One Faith, One Christ. Today is communion service today. We will remember Lord Jesus as we remember him every day, but we will take time out to add an extra part of our service to break bread and drink of the vine. So welcome to our call to worship this morning a time for us to get together and praise and worship to the Lord for all of his wonderful things that he has done for us. We look forward to a blessed Sunday this morning. We pray that again that we do something that will bless you today. So we thank you for being with us and we pray that you will receive something that will cause you to be moved and stirred and if you're new to the church and new to this service, we hope that this will be something that will cause you to ask, what must I do to be saved? So let us begin our call to worship in Psalm 136. And we'll read verses 1 through 3, Psalm 136. Again, a thanksgiving for God's enduring mercy. And I can't tell you how much that means, the mercy someone extends mercy to you, that means that they have foregone destroying you. Psalm 136, verses 1 through 3. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the God of gods, for his mercy endures forever. O oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endures forever. Now let us praise God in whatever manner you see fitting to you as the worship team leads you in praise and worship. Amen. Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord. Feel free to clap your hands with us today as we worship him. Thank you, Lord. You turn into wine, open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you, none like you. Into the darkness you shine, out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you, none like you. Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God, our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God. Our God, water you turn into wine, open the eyes of the blind, there's no one like you, none like you, into the darkness you shine, out of the ashes we rise, there's no one like you. God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God, our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, power, our God. You are Lord, and if our God is for us, 
who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, what can stand against? If our God is for us, who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, what can stand against? What can stand against? Our God is greater, our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. And if our God is for us, who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, what could stand against? What could stand against? Our God is greater, our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. Thank you, Lord. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer. Awesome in power, our God, our God, our God is greater, our God is stronger, God, you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. great and greatly to be praised. Thank you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. Your breath 
in our lungs, Lord. So we pour out our praise to you only. Great are you, Lord. Yes, you are. Great are you, Lord. All the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing God 
and all will see how great, how great, and all will see how great, how great, all will see how great, how great is our God, and all see how great, how great, and all will see how great, how great is our Sometimes we just can't comprehend his greatness because a lot of times we don't see it working in our lives, but it is working in your lives. So let's look at uh, Psalm 138 for our scripture reading this morning as we continue our praise and worship, Psalm 138. We look at the Lord's goodness in verses 1 through 3. I will praise you with my whole heart. Before the gods, I will sing praises to you. I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name. For your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word above all your name. In the day when I cried out, you answered me and made me bold with strength in my soul. So some may be wondering about the particular verses I pick for our praise and worship. It's supposed to be a time of uplifting, a time of rejuvenation of your spirit and soul as we come together. So in looking at some of these scriptures, I want to be sure to edify you, to get you to realize God's in your corner, that God is working for you and not against you. He's working to strengthen you and not weaken you. And I want to show you what he has in store for you. So Father, we pray this morning that you will forgive us of our sins, Lord God, and help us, Heavenly Father, to be enlightened by you and your word, to be ever mindful that you are working for our benefits, working for our grander and greater life, O oh Lord. That, Father God, you are working toward us, seeing you in eternity. So, Lord God, we do pray that you will look upon this service this morning, Heavenly Father, all of the facets of it, to see that they are doing your will, to work in conjunction with what you desire and you design, Heavenly Father. If anything is being done, Father God, that does not conform to you and your standards, prevent it from happening, Heavenly Father. Stop us from saying things we ought not say. Stop us from moving places we ought not move. Stop us from going to things that we should not go to and even associating with those we should not associate with. So, Lord God, we just continue to pray for your ever-growing care and concern over us. Lord, we know that you're there. We know that you're working. We know that you are moving on our behalf. So, Father God, for some who may not see it or believe it, Father God, give them something to believe in. Give them something to see. And I know that Jesus says this adulterous nation asks for a sign, but, Father, I'm not asking for a sign just asking that you uplift and empower those who may be of little faith, who may need a little bit more encouragement. So Father God, we just pray that you will help them and get them, Father God, going in and us for anything that we're lacking, Father God. Fill us with the things that are needful, the things that are useful, Heavenly Father, and tear out those things which 
tend to keep us down and keep us from moving forward in that direction you want us to go, Lord God. So Heavenly Father, tear off those broken parts of our heart and repair it and fill it with the Holy Spirit and the love of God. And give us those things, Lord, that we need. And we thank you, Father, for your daily bread, continuing to provide for us and allow us, Lord God, to continue on through this day. So, Father, we look upon those, Lord, who may be sick and afflicted right now, Heavenly Father. Give them, Heavenly Father, first and foremost, encouragement that you will see to their illness, that you will see to their malady, that you will see to their affliction. And, Lord God, I am not one to tell you how to fix it, but, Lord God, I know that you will fix it, that you will make things the way you want it to be. So look upon those who are sick and afflicted, Father God, and move in their lives and cause whatever it is you desire to happen to them, Father God, to happen. And to give everyone around witnessing and watching peace and comfort in whatever decision you make, Father God, and whatever desire you have, Lord God. Help us to be comfortable with that. Help us to be right with that. Help us to be okay with that. And Father God, we pray for Heavenly Father for those who may be uh, out of work or not making enough to make ends meet, Lord. Father, we just pray that you will fix them up financially. However, again, Father God, you do is what you do. And we know that you're all powerful and you control all the monies. You control all the resources. You control the hearts and minds of the people who believe they control the monies, Father God. So, Father God, we pray that you'll help those looking for promotions, help those in their jobs looking for raises. And Heavenly Father, just help each and every one of us as we go through our jobs to be comfortable in what we're doing and what you've given us and help us in our families those with uh, children and husbands and wives and relationships Lord God we pray that you'll heal those that are seem to be broken to keep the family unit together and to keep those relationships strong Heavenly Father because I know at times we find simple and stupid reasons why we want to break up why we want to tear apart the thing that you've brought together. So, Father God, we pray that you'll cleanse minds and cleanse hearts and put away some of those foolish and childish notions and ideas that will cause relationships to tear apart. And, Lord God, give us a sense of compassion, a sense of love for one another. And, Father God, we just pray that you will continue to work upon us because, Father God, we need you. Because if we look at our state of affairs and the way things are going, Father God, left to ourselves, Lord God, we'll destroy it all. So, Father God, we need your leading. We need your guiding. We need your care and comfort. And, Lord, I just ask all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for me to shed his blood so that I may be saved. In his precious name, amen. Can you just turn to your neighbor, tell them good morning, good, good to morning, see you? Good good morning, turn good to, to your you other all. neighbor on the other side or in the back of you. <laughs> we're blessed in the city, we're blessed in the field. We're blessed when we come and when we go. We cast down every stronghold, sickness and poverty must cease. For the devil is defeated, we are blessed. We're blessed in the city, we're blessed in the field. We're blessed when we come, when we go. We cast down every stronghold, sickness and poverty must see. For the devil is defeated, we are blessed. Late in the midnight. God's going to turn it around. He's going to work in your favor. Yes, he is. Late in the midnight hour, God's going to turn it around and around and around and around. Late in the midnight, late in the midnight hour, God's going to turn it around. 
he's going to work in your favor. Since late in the midnight hour, God's going to turn it around and around and around and around. We're blessed. We're blessed in the city. We're blessed in the field. We're blessed when we come, when we go. We cast down every stronghold. Sickness and poverty must see, for the devil is defeated. We are blessed. One more time. We're blessed in the city, blessed in the field. We're blessed when we come, when we go. We cast down every stronghold. Sickness and poverty must see, for the devil is defeated. We are blessed. our time of offering, time of giving, to give back a little bit that the Lord has blessed you with. And again, if you're here in the sanctuary, you can come to the offering plate anytime you feel like to bring your tithes and offerings. And if you're on our website or you're watching this through an archive or you're in another country, you can go to www.onefaithonechrist.org and press the Give menu item, and that'll open up a window and allow you to provide your tithes and offerings through that way. Or you can use Zelle and utilize the, our email address, info at onefaithonechrist.org, and that'll set you up to be able to give your tithes and offerings that way. Or if you want to come into the church or mail to the church at 1327 East Muritania Street, Wilmington, California, 90744. And if you have any other electronic means that you would like to utilize, let us know at info at onefaithonechrist.org and we will help set that up for you. We want to ensure that however you want to get your tithes and offerings in, we can make everything available for you. So, Father, we thank you for this time of giving, this time of offering, this time, Father God, where we, Lord God, bless you with the resources that you've bestowed upon us. So, Father God, I pray for this offering, Lord God, that is utilized to do the will and, and desires that you have for this church, oh, Lord God. And, Father God, we pray that you have indeed blessed each and every giver, that you, Father God, will reward them individually for their desire to give back to you. So Lord God, we just think, continue to thank you and pray for this offering in Jesus' name, amen. That you, my King, would die for me. 
Practice, practice, right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. I did. Uh, someone mentioned that you can sing off key like me. I said, yeah. The Lord loves you no matter what key you're singing in. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> see now, see now we chime in for the musician. No, we need to be in tune. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's be in tune with our message this morning. <laughs> so we're going to look at a message called You Got Benefits. <laughs> so we're going to look at Psalm 68, verses 19 through 20. And we're going to look at these benefits that the Lord has for us. Psalm 68, 19 through 20. Blessed be the Lord who daily loads us with benefits, the God of our salvation. Our God is the God of salvation, and to God the Lord belongs escapes from death. Now, some of you may be reading that and say it, say, saying it along with me, and you may have noticed I didn't say this one word, Salah, Selah. And I didn't say it because it's not meant to be said. Since psalms are musical, poetic, Selah is a silence, a pause. So we don't say it. So again, this is a cheap teaching church. I want to make sure you understand. So as you read the Psalms and you see Selah in there, don't say it. Just stop for a moment and give pause to what was just said. 
And you notice it said, the God of our salvation, exclamation point. Pause and take that in. So when we look at you got benefits, first, let's look at the dictionary's definition of a benefit. Okay? So looking at any of our popular dictionaries, I found four definitions for a benefit. The first one is something that promotes or enhances well-being and advantage. The second one is help or aid. The third one, a payment made or an entitlement available in accordance with a wage agreement, an insurance policy, or a public assistance program. The fourth one is a kindly deed. Okay? So I'm going to apply that to all that the Lord does for us in the benefits package that he gives us in life. So when we apply for a job, one of the things we look for is whether or not the job has a good benefits package. We want to be sure that, you know, you're giving me health care, you're giving me... Um, dental and vision and, and uh, bonus packages and all of these things. So those benefits we look for include, like I said, health, dental, good pay, good co-workers. Some of us don't look for good co-workers. We just take the job. And then we complain about these people we work with. But we need to be looking out for good co-workers. You know, we want to make sure. And then I have to say this, too. We got to make sure that you're the good co-worker as well. <laughs> you know, you might not bring in your toxicity into the, into, the, into the workforce. And I have to mention, I, I, wor I did work at a company where I brought a lot of toxicity. I was, I was labeled the angry programmer. <laughs> and so we got to look at coworkers as our benefits. And we look at bonuses and chance for advancement. Am I going to stagnate in this job, or am I going to be able to move upwards in rank? But these benefits from a job cover only one of the definitions that I read about. The benefits from a job only covers one. But what, are we, but what we are going to discuss today are the benefits that Christ has given us when we accept his invitation to be workers in his vineyard. And yes, you have accepted to be workers in his vineyard. Although you're not going to be out there picking grapes or strawberries or anything like that, you will be harvesting souls. To be co-heirs with him in the kingdom of God. And during our discussion, you will notice how Christ gives us more in the area of benefits than any other job can compete with. Noticing that when we work for Christ Jesus, we not only get the one benefit definition as related to a job, but we get all four of the definitions that I previously spoke of. So your job, you get the one. Salary, advancement, promotions and things. But the other three, the job doesn't give you. No help or aid. And it's not a kindly deed. They're not doing it to be kind to you. They're doing it because they need you to do something for them. They need you to help them profit. It was a thing one person had said that he commented on minimum wage. He says, why minimum wage? He says, well, if a company can give you nothing, they would. So somebody had to step in and say, no, you got to pay him at least this much. Because as a company, I'll give you what I, can, I feel like. And, it, and that may not be, you know, anything that's going to help you and your family succeed. So the company is not necessarily looking out for your best interest. So it's not a kindly deed, right? They need you for something. And it's a symbiotic relationship because you need them as well. They need you, you need them. But God doesn't need us. He wants us. 
to participate in his work. So this is, again, this is going to be a part of a kindly deed because God did a kindly deed, and we're going to talk about that. Because as we read in our scriptures, blessed be the Lord who daily loads us with benefits. Daily. Okay? And again, if you work for a company, sometimes those benefits don't kick in to 90 days after you work there. And then they may find reason to not let you work there after 90 days. You didn't pass the, you know, the, the probation period. So you get no benefits, no job, nothing. And so when we talk about God's mercy, God does not have a probation period for us. We screw up. This is okay. Can you get it together? Yeah, I can get it together. All right, let's move forward with that. That's God. Your company, nope, that's a warning in your record. That's a mark against you. Too many of those, boom, you're gone. And I have to say the same thing with God on that one. Too many of those and you're gone as well. You know? So he does follow suit with you, know, you and I messing up too much. But I think he's more lenient than any job out there. So let's look at the benefit number one. Something that promotes or advances well-being and advantage. Look at John chapter 14, verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Okay? So now we're looking at benefit number one, something that promotes or enhances well-being and advantage. With the benefit of the peace of mind that Jesus promises us, we start to experience the enhanced well-being that only Christ Jesus can bring. And you got to think about this. Only when you have peace of mind can you really feel well. I mean, when you're all stressed out and everything is, seems troubling and the world is caving in on you, you're not well. And stress leads to bad health. Stress leads to many things that go wrong in the body. So Jesus says, take upon my peace and know that the world is in bad shape, is in bad disarray. He said, but take my peace. Don't stress over that. Have well-being. Have a sense of calm. And in our hours of sorrow, Christ promises us a unique kind of peace that is different from what the world offers. Friends can come and tell you, you know, okay, it's okay, you're going to be okay, you're going to be good, it's going to be fine, you're going to make it through it. But Christ says, no, I give you something much better than that. I'm not giving you platitudes like, say, friends would give you. Jesus says, no, I'm giving you a serious peace. It is the benefit of Christ's peace that gives us calm with our troubled and fearful hearts. If we can just sit back and whatever is going on and look to Christ Jesus and say, Lord, it's in your hands. You told me to put it at your, your footstep. You told me to put it there to you and you will handle it. And then you can be unburdened with that. And that's that peace that takes care of your troubles and trials through the day. And Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 through 7 says this. Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And if you guys have been with me long enough, you realize that that's our benediction that I use when we close so that you will leave here and go to your destination with that peace that again surpasses all understanding we just cannot grasp the peace that God can give us if we take it there was um it was funny I, I saw a, a meme today and I think the Lord gave it to me this meme just for this particular occasion because I normally don't look at that stuff this morning but I was turning off my computer and as the screen changed, it showed this meme. And basically, there was this man in Canada. He had a sign that said, free money, take it. And he had a, a pile of American cash down there on the, on by his feet. Everybody just walked by. 
Nobody took it. Nobody took any of that money. And this shows, again, the peace that God gives, that Christ gives. Sometimes we just don't accept it. It's right there in front of our face. It's a big sign. You know, here's some peace for you. Here's some calm for you. <laughs> like, I don't trust it. I don't know. I, I can't believe that. You know, you're, you're, you're scamming me. But it's free. So we need to avail ourselves of that peace. It's there. It's, it's just waiting for you to come and take it off that table. So in this scripture I just read, we are told how we access the peace of Christ. This benefit is available to us by simply bringing your troubles to the Lord. That's all it takes. Give it to the Lord. And he'll take care of it. And some will say, but it's too big. I, I, you know, I, I, I got to handle this. Otherwise, I'm a failure if I don't handle it. And the problem is that you're going to be a failure if you do try to handle it. Because most times we create more trouble for ourselves trying to fix a problem when we really don't have a solution for. So our well-being is enhanced because we have a means to unburden ourselves to the one, the only one who can handle our troubles. And a lot of times, face it, some of these troubles are just too massive. But we try and figure ways to solve it. We try and figure means and to solve things. A lot of people go into debt because they try and solve their financial problems by creating more financial debt. I had a talk with someone and they wanted to, well, maybe if I get another credit card, I can help pay off the other ones. And I'm like, no, it's not going to work. Why not? Because they're willing to give me $10,000 and, and I can pay off. I said, but now you got another $10,000 of debt. Is that going to pay off every other credit card? If that's the case, then you're already paying off $10,000 worth of debt, right? So how is that going to solve your problem? Because now you're going to have three credit cards. <laughs> and now that you paid those off, oh, I can go buy something now. <laughs> so I said, no, let's rethink that. Let's pray about this. Let's work on your financial issue without trying to pile on top of it. And so that's what us sometimes, we take our troubles and we try to pile on top of it because we think we have the solution to the problem. Now I'm not saying take every single last problem to Jesus. Some of them you can fix. And he says, yeah, you fix those because they're well within your means to do so. But with those troubles that you know you can't fix and you're trying to take a hammer to fix something that's very small, or something that you know you don't have the ability to, to do, then you're creating more trouble. And Jesus says, with him we have the benefit of peace of mind, and in him we have the advantage of coming to him for our troubles, knowing that God can and will handle it. I have friends tell me, you know, anything you come to me, let me know, just let me know. Okay, so the one time I did come to them, I can't help you out. I'm like, well, then why you ask? Why you tell me you uh, you made this, uh, you know, a, an open invitation that anything you can fix? Because if there's anything, come to me, and I help you out. Oh man, I ain't. I'm, <laughs> I can't help you out today. I said, well, then you are no help at all. So praise the Lord because you got benefits. Once you accept Christ Jesus on His merits. You have benefits. Let's look at benefit number two, help or aid. And for that, we're going to find it in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 through 16. Hebrews 4, 15 through 16. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So, it says that, again, we're not asking that friend who has never gone through our problems, that friend who has never gone through our issues, 
But we have someone who has gone through things, some things even greater than our own problems. None of you have had to die for someone else. None of you have had to be beaten for someone else. So Jesus went through all of this, and as it says, in all points were tempted as we are. Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness. He gave him power, or wanted to give him power. Wanted to give him food when he was hungry. And wanted to give him authority over things. And so all of our lives, we're all tempted in those three ways as well. And Jesus was tempted in that. And then he even tempted with people wanting to hurt him and to kill him. So again, in all points, he was tempted as we are. So we have someone to look at that has gone through some stuff. Okay? And like I said, the stuff we go through, eh, nothing compared to the stuff Jesus went through. But yet, he was tempted. So he knows, he understands, he sympathizes, and can help. I have to say, there was a time when a church I had went to, they wanted all of the couples to go to a counseling session, regardless if you have problems in your life or not, because the, their assumption was every couple has problems. And I agree, every couple does have problems, but not every problem in a couple's life demands someone to talk to you about it. You know, we work through a lot of stuff in our, in our own couples, and our own relationships. But anyway, this counselor is dealing with couples. And so I remember I asked, I asked her the question. I asked her this one question. I asked her, was she, was she married? She said, no. Are you in a relationship? She said, no. I said, well, how can you help us? If you, if you have not gone through these things, are not going through these things, how can you sit there and tell us what we need to do? And so I sat there silent because there was no point in me talking to her. And so that's why, again, I'm the angry programmer, right? Because <laughs> I'm just disgruntled. <laughs> but I didn't see any point to it. What can you tell me? You haven't gone through anything in regards to, you know, relationships apparently because you have none so either either whatever ones you had are gone or you never had any you can't help us you got to be going through some stuff too so jesus says i've gone through stuff i can help you so here we have the benefit of christ our high priest who is now beyond being afflicted afflicted by the problems that we suffer he's beyond that because he's sitting at the right hand of god in heaven and because he has risen from the dead, we as believers can also tap into his strength. He risen from the dead. That's strength. And he said by his power he did so. And we know this benefit is available to us because Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 4 verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So we have that ability for help or aid. Because Jesus says, because I have defeated death, we can do all things through him. Because Christ lived, we can benefit from his strength. We are afforded the opportunity to give our troubles over to him, and by his strength it will be fixed. For it was his stripes that heals us today. He was beaten so that we can be, and I gave this sermon, unbeatable. We have the benefit of not having to suffer what he suffered so that we can be called children of God. To accept the benefit of his help and aid, all we need do is to believe that he can do all that help for us in our time of trouble. Just believe. For most of us, we spend a great deal of time, money, anguish, pain, and resources to try and pull us through a difficult situation. 
But all we need do is believe that Christ Jesus is the Lord over all and it will be done. And the simple thing with that is to just get down on your knees and pray. He says, give me whatever it is that you have. And I will work on it. And in the book of Mark, we have an illustration of a woman who took advantage of this benefit. And because of her belief, she was healed. She took advantage of this help or aid through Jesus Christ. So let's look at Mark chapter 5, verses 25 through 29. And look at someone who actually took hold of this benefit of help or aid. Mark 5, 25 through 29. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather got worse or grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. So she took belief in that, and she did so through fear of death. Because someone, when a woman in the uh, time of the, or even today, the Jewish people believe that a woman was going through a menstruation and things, she's unclean. So she's not really allowed to be around other people, according to the Jewish laws. So but she's been afflicted for years. And so to come out and be unclean and not announce being unclean, the punishment can be death. Because now you've affected the entire populace. So she risked, it, risked life and limb to have this problem solved by secretly coming out in this unclean state, and saying, I don't need to talk to Jesus. I don't need to stop him and, and tell him to fix my problem. She says, if I just believe he can, I know he can, it will happen. And so she threw in the idea that touching his hem of his garment would do that. And Jesus even said he felt power drained from him because someone touched him. And his disciples said, hey, people are touching you because you're in a crowd. People touch you all over the place. Why did you feel power drained from one particular touch? And he turned around and told the woman, you know, you're healed because of your faith. So she took advantage of that benefit, help or aid from Jesus. She didn't try and fix it herself. I mean, she had tried all those 12 years and nothing happened. She was broke, had no more money. Physicians couldn't do anything. So I guess for us, we need to take a note from her. Take hold of the hem of Christ's garment and see that you have benefits. Now we can take hold of his garment by praying. By again, however it is you pray, pray to him. Let's look at our third benefit as from the dictionary. A payment made or an entitlement available in accordance with a wage agreement, an insurance policy, or a public assistance program. For that one, let's look at Mark chapter, excuse me, Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. So a payment was made for you and me. We have all fallen short of the glory of God because of the sin nature that wants to rise up in us. So there was a payment, a wage agreement made. And that payment was the life of Jesus. Because of our sin-stained image, we are worthy of death. And that's, again, where God's mercy kicks in. Because of sin, God said sin is punishable by death. 
And it even says in Scripture, for the wages of sin is death. But thanks be to Christ Jesus who has paid for our sins by his work. He ransomed us. We became an heir to his kingdom. Oh, the wonderful benefits that our Father in heaven wants to bestow upon us. We that are in Christ Jesus have the benefit and entitlement of presenting ourselves to the Father. So because of Jesus dying on the cross, that's the payment. So I know you look at payment as something given to you. But realize this. When he paid for it, it gave something to you. It gave you the right to eternal life in heaven. So again, a payment isn't always monetary. Back in the day, barter system, and I think even today you barter. People still barter with stuff. You know, I'll give you something for this or, you know, you do some work for me and I'll, you know, give you some food or something like that. So in this case, Jesus died for us, paid the cost, and we receive the benefit. And so for God, the wage agreement is blood for sin, and that's what he says. The person who sins has to die. And in his marvelous plan for our salvation, he came to earth in the form of a man, a perfect sin offering, so that the price could be paid. Before the Jewish would sacrifice animals, it was not the perfect offering. It was called an atonement. God would look over the sin. Sin wasn't gone. It looked over it. But Jesus being that perfect sin offering, our sins are eradicated. I'm not saying that you're still not capable of sinning, but he is able for the sins you do commit to offer the sacrifice for. But be aware that like in any job, if you keep committing the same infraction, they will fire you. And God says the same thing, that the sacrifice can be used up. That you can keep committing that same infraction over and over and over again until finally there's no more sacrifice left. <coughs> Excuse me. So look at Romans chapter 6, verse 22 through 23. Romans 6, 22 through 23. But now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, understand this. You're going to spend eternity after death one of two places. Heaven or hell. So when we say eternal life, that means heaven. The other eternity is eternal death, and that's hell. So we notice here that Paul writes of us to have eternal life in Christ our Lord, not the other one. So because the price was paid by Jesus dying on the cross, and we have accepted the wage agreement by believing on Christ Jesus, we have the insurance policy of an eternal life with the Father. So you see how we worked all, all together? Got the wage agreement. Got the insurance policy. And you got benefits because our Father in heaven wants the best for you. And not only is it a great benefit but a gift given to you. Not because of the hard work you put in, but because of his great grace and mercy. Do you know that companies don't have to give you health insurance? They don't have to give you vision, dental, and medical. They don't have to. There's no law stating that they have to give you this. Okay? But they give it to you because it's beneficial for them. All right? 
Because the better you are, the more productive you are. The more productive you are, the more profitable we can be. So they give this benefit, not necessarily for you. Okay, it is for you. But again, it's self-serving. If you're productive, then you're going to increase my profit. So I can do this. And besides, the government's going to give me back some of it anyway for taxes. So there is no employee program that I know of that can compare with the employee program that my Father in Heaven is giving out to those who simply believe. Now, how many of you have gotten a job by just going in the interview and saying, oh, I believe in your company? That's good enough. Now, forget about my qualifications all I believe. Your company is the greatest, I believe it. Hire me. Well, in God's employee program, it's just a simple thing of believing, a simple thing of following. And he says, you're hired, you're in. God's benefit package provides us with a public assistance program by way of the Holy Spirit. So now we deal with the, the assistance here, right? We get a public assistance program by way of the Holy Spirit. Do you ever think about that? Let's look at John chapter 14, verses uh, 13 through 18. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. For he dwells with you and will be in you, and I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. So in our benefits package with God, we are told that we can ask for anything in his name, and it will be done for us. Now, please, we've got to understand what this really means. You really can't ask for anything. There's only going to be those things which are spirit-led and those things which are needful and meaningful. And this is because Jesus left us the Holy Spirit that dwells within us forever. And because of God's benefits, the Comforter will never leave us. Now, sometimes we, I get into debates with people about this, and they say, you'll never leave us. I'm like, sure, God said he will never leave us or never forsake us. But you forget the component you. You can leave him. God's forever there waiting for you. But you can decide just like, you know, in, in a relationship, you know what? I don't love you anymore. I'm moving on. I, I no longer want this relationship. So the Holy Spirit doesn't turn away from you. It is us that turns away from the Holy Spirit. So this statement is still true. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. But we can leave him and forsake him. So let's look at John chapter 14, verse 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. So when we look at this, as we work in God's kingdom, God says this. If you read the word of God and bring it into your mind, the Holy Spirit is categorizing it and putting it away. And he says, when the time is needed, and we sit back and we fret, oh, I don't know enough scriptures. Oh, I don't know how to talk to people about Jesus. Oh, I don't know how I'm going to be able to, you know, uh, be a prayer warrior. I don't know how to do all these things in God's kingdom. He says, the Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance those things. 
So again, don't be anxious for anything because God says, I got a backup plan for you. If you can't remember it, I'm going to bring it to your remembrance. The Holy Spirit has been categorizing it, putting it away. And all you need to do is call upon him. And at that time, he will make it known to whoever it is you're talking to. Because we are workers in the Father's vineyards, we got benefits. So now let's look at our fourth benefit that we had from our dictionary, a kindly deed. And for that one, we're going to go to our, should be our most well-known scripture, John 3.16, but I'm adding in 17 as well. So let's look at John 3.16 through 17 to look at a kindly deed. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. A kindly deed. Now just looking at that last portion of it, but that the world through him might be saved. That is a kindly deed all by itself. He didn't have to do it. God could have wiped it all clean and started anew, created a new body and new people but nope he says you're flawed but I'm not going to hold that against you I'm going to bring in a way to save you from your own flaws that's a kindly deed and like I said if that is not a kindly deed then I don't know what is God's love for us is so great that he would send his son to pay the ultimate price for us Talk about a benefit. So going back to our job, if you went to your CEO and said, you know what, I need your son to die so that we can be saved. CEO would say, you're fired. Get out of here. You're crazy. (laughs) So what employer would give up their son for your life? Hmm? So again, you've noticed I've been contrasting this with work life and companies. I know you got it, but just had to say it. Because I know most of the CEOs I knew didn't even want to talk to me, so let alone sacrifice their son for me. I was just a peon to them, you know. It's like, you know, what are you even doing close to my office? Let's look at Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Remember I told you earlier that God says the sacrifice, or should I say, the is blood for sin. And God demanded blood for the atonement for our souls, and Jesus stepped up to pay the price for us, thus giving us one of the greatest benefits that God can offer to us, to be washed clean of our sins. In that benefits package that God gives us, he says, you're a sinful people. He says, but I'm going to throw in my benefit package that you can be clean from that, that you can be fixed from that. You got benefits with the Father, and now is the time to take stock in those benefits and not take them for granted. So going back to that woman with the issue of blood, have faith of the woman with the issue of blood and take hold of the hem of Christ's garment. So now I'm going to give you an opportunity to take hold of Christ's garment's hem of his clothing. First, you got to accept him. And like she did, she believed. She just believed. And so I'm calling upon you to now do the same. If you have not accepted Christ Jesus, I'm calling upon you to just believe. To dispel or, 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 or suspend any idea of whatever your Christian notions or whatever your religious notions are about God, about Christ, and whether they're, you know, 
whether I'm just talking a bunch of garbage, suspend that belief for a minute and just believe. And Jesus says, all you have to do is believe, and that benefit package is yours. So we talked about this benefit package, all this particular message. And so now I'm coming to the point where you can accept that package, and just like a job interview, they give you an offer letter. And all you have to do is say, I agree, sign it, you're hired. Christ says the same. All you need to do is believe you're accepted. And your signature is your word that says, Lord, I believe. So if you'd like to accept Christ Jesus today and know that he died for you to uh, wash away your sins, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. This is a prayer of acceptance in Jesus Christ. If you want to accept him, if you want to accept the job offer that he has given you, He says his his yoke is easy, his burden is light, meaning that he's not going to make you work hard. Pray this prayer with me and mean it, and then you will be accepted in to the job that Jesus has for you to accept the benefits package that is so marvelous. Only a fool would turn it down. So if you'd like to accept Christ Jesus today, pray this prayer with me and mean it. And it goes as thus. Father God in heaven, forgive me of my sins. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die for me. Lord Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice that will give me eternal life. Come into my heart and make me who you want me to be. Thank you for accepting me. And in this prayer, I pray that you will lead me and guide me to righteousness. In your name I pray. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer and meant it, then welcome to the body of believers, the church. Now, know that the church is the full body of believers worldwide. Although we have this physical entity, this church here, all body of believers are called the church. And if you were in my Bible study, you will find out that the first time the word church was used is in the book of Mark. I mean, excuse me, Matthew, where he called out the people as his church and talked about Peter being the rock. Not that the church is built on, but he's the rock in the church. Okay. Jesus is the rock of the church. He's the foundational cornerstone of the church. And so being a new believer, we want to make sure that this particular church can help you out with resources, information, and guidance to get your walk with Jesus going well. So first of all, there's our church address, 1327 East Muritania Street, Wilmington, California, 90744. This is our physical address. You can come with us on Sunday mornings if you would like to be a part of our fellowship that's here or continue to watch on the uh, other side of our camera. But that's our address if you want to send us mail or information we we want us to uh, impart to you, you can let us know that way. And also our web address, www.onefaithonechrist.org. For those who are watching this on archive or looking at it through Facebook at this moment or some of the other platforms I have. That is our web address so that you can go and look at our information that we have, our contact information. Again, the address is there. And we also have sermons or some of our archive sermons. Each, each sermon that we do is placed up there uh, shortly after the sermon 
so you can have access to that to see some of the other sermons that were available at the time that we gave them. And so we want to ensure that you have whatever you need to help you in your walk with Christ. And our email address, info at onefaithonechrist.org. If you want to drop us an email and let us know if you need uh, Bibles, you need resources to help out in your new journey with Christ. And even if you're already on your journey with Christ, you still, we have resources for you as well. And we want to make sure that everybody is being equipped with what they need as they take their walk with Christ Jesus. That's one of the part of the, the, the benefits package. This is one of the satellite offices, you might call it that you can come here and we can give you help, aid, um, if need be, I don't know, financial assistance to an extent as God gives us the ability to do. But the benefits package is available and we want to be part of that uh, help to give to you that. And so along with that as a new believer, you need to now start reading your Bible So you need to start reading this so that you know what God has to say to you. Sometimes people are wondering, how come God isn't speaking to me? Because you ain't reading his word. Sometimes he speaks to you, or most of the time he speaks to you through his word. Many times you're not going to sit there and hope God's going to talk to your conscience and get you to to know or understand something. Sometimes he's going to lead you to the word where he has covered every single thing under the sun is in this book. Okay? So, You need to start cracking this open, start reading it. And you may not understand it, but like I said, the Holy Spirit will continue to categorize it and log it away. And then we have a Bible study on Wednesdays and Fridays to help you understand a lot of the information that is written in the Word of God. And we, we do our Bible studies by books. So right now on Wednesdays, we're in the book of Matthew. And we go every Wednesday, uh, we cover a chapter, or depend upon how, the, uh, how detailed the chapter may be, we may cut it in half. But we're going to go through chapter by chapter. And on Fridays, we're going through the book of Numbers. So Fridays kind of led down the Old Testament track. Wednesdays are going down the New Testament track. And after a while, the two are going to merge together. So to study a word, Join us on uh, Fridays and Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And to get the Zoom number, or, yeah, we have the Zoom phone numbers as well as the um, link. Send us an email at info at one faith, one Christ, and we will get you that information so that you can start your Bible study with us. And then on to prayer. Remember, we need to ask Jesus. He says, for some of those benefits, you got to ask. So how can you ask if you don't pray with him? So this does not cover your daily prayers. This is just our corporate prayer where we all get together and pray together as a church. And for anybody else who wants to be a part of that prayer, it's not, um, it's not limited to only the members in this church. If you want to invite family, friends, and others to be a part of this prayer meeting, we have that on Thursdays at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And the number for the United States is 657-390-4716. And remember, uh, prayer requests are at info at onefaithonechrist.org. If you want to send prayer requests in uh, before Thursday or even on Thursday, we will, we will get them and tee them up for the prayer meeting. And um, if you're international, we have some international numbers for the countries that have asked for um, the number. And you need to send us an email at info at onefaithonechrist.org because our international numbers are blocked by an access code so that we don't have everybody in the world, you know, trying to get on our conference call and using it for their own purposes. So give us an email and also let us know if you're a new country and we will add you to our list here. We praise God for the ever-growing list. We praise him for our ability to reach globally. And I know the time differences are such that some, you know, send me uh, things in prayer uh, through email because it's just uh, they just can't get up in the because for them most times our our uh, seven o'clock prayer meeting is in the middle of the night for them, 
And so, you know, we praise God for some of them who did do it at one or two times. But we praise God for you that you can be a part of our prayer meeting. But you need to have your own prayer life. And so with that, we just continue to give thanks to God. And this is our communion service today. So give you time to prepare for our service with uh, whatever drink you have and cracker wafer bread or whatever you're going to use for this communion service. And remember, we do this in accordance to what Jesus wants us to do for the Lord's Supper. So, Let me give you something that was given to the disciples back then to commemorate the beginning of uh, this communion services so that we understand how and why it came about. So I don't, I don't have, you, you guys don't have this scripture. I didn't give it to you on the uh, screens back there. So, so don't worry about trying to pull it up. So in Luke chapter 22, uh, beginning at verse 10, Jesus tells the disciples, he says, And he said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house which he enters. There we shall say to the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large furnished upper room there, make ready. So Jesus, I, I just love this because Jesus says, when you go into a certain city, there's going to be a man carrying a pitcher of water. Wow. Wow telling you ahead of time, prophesizing that there's going to be a guy carrying some water. And he's going to know where we're going to eat at tonight. Follow him in that house he goes in. That room, prepare it. And this is where Jesus institutes what we call the Lord's Supper. So that moves into chapter, uh, same chapter 22 and verses 14 on... And he says this, when the hour had come, he sat down and 12 apostles with him. Then he said unto them, I'm sorry, to them. Sometimes the King James kicks back into my head. <laughs> In seminary school, that's what we were drilled with, the King James Version. So I'm using the new King James. So sometimes that, the, the two seek together. He says, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat the Passover with you before I suffer for I say to you I will no longer eat of it until it is test fulfilled in the kingdom of God then he took the cup and gave thanks and said take this and divide it accordingly among yourselves for I say to you I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes and he took bread gave thanks and broke it again and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup at, at the supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the other table. So, Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. And he says, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. So he doesn't give a timetable as to when and how many times. A lot of churches do it every Sunday. We do it once a month, the beginning of the month, considered first fruits. So if you'd like to participate in the Lord's Supper this morning and you feel that you are not worthy of it, I'm going to give a moment of silent prayer or wherever you're at. If you want to pray loud, that's up to you.
and ask God for forgiveness of anything you think that's keeping you, holding you back from having uh, communion service with us this morning. So this is a time for you now to take upon that benefits package and take that helper aid from Jesus to say, I will forgive you of your sins. So if you feel you're not worthy, I would want you to pray this so that you can participate in this service. So we're going to take a moment allow you to pray to God and ask him for forgiveness if there's anything that you think you need to be forgiven of to be a partaker of this service take that moment now I hope that was sufficient for you to pray. And so now we'll begin our communion service. So for those who would like to partake of communion service, just come around. and keep each and every one of you that he will cover you care for you and look upon you and guide you through all things we pray father god that your blessing will hold dear to each and every one that they will prepare you for the coming christ and look upon each and every one that they will be of good cheer and covered in the blood of christ jesus we pray father god for your blessing, your loving grace. In Jesus' name, amen. So is everyone who wanted to participate um, able? Have taken one? Did you want? I said, you know best when ready. So has everyone got this? Okay, take the bread. And Jesus says, take, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat. Need another one? Everybody, we have these multi-container things, and sometimes they pose a problem. So we may go back to crackers and juice. <laughs> well, see, you thought this was a smarter idea. Like, it all contained us. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> and Jesus took the cup and said, drink. This is the blood that is shed for the remissions of sin. Take and drink. So as they all did that, they all sang a hymn and went home. May Father God, you continue to look upon us and give us your wonderful blessings and grace today. And as we leave this place, but never your presence, we pray, Father God, for your coverage and care upon us. Continue to grow us and make us into who you want us to be. And may the peace of God which surpasses understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus as we all sing together. Amen. God bless.
Thank you, Mark. I got those because I thought it may be.